Hello and welcome to another edition of the Knicks Film School pregame show. My name is Andrew Claudio, a.k.a. GMAC, and it's time to preview the Knicks upcoming matchup on Saturday afternoon against the Brooklyn Nets. The third time the Knicks will be taking on their crosstown rivals. We'll see how much of a rivalry this still is with two teams in different places in the standings. Uh, we should mention, as always, uh, to our friends over at T-Squared Social, if you're in the New York City area and you'd like to join us for the latest KFS watch party, we'll be there starting at noon on Saturday uh, for our latest KFS watch party. Uh, it's a pregame watch party. Starts at noon. We'll be there for the entire game, NCAA games all day as well. We hope to break the KFS curse where we'll actually be together to watch a game together. Uh, and I know somebody who would very much like for the curse to continue, regardless of what's going on with his basketball team at the moment. Joining me from WFAN, the probably the most notorious Nets fan uh, in this market for the last better part of 20 years. Uh, Mr. Evan Roberts of Evan and Tiki. Evan, how you doing, my man? As a human, I'm doing okay. As a basketball <laughs> fan, I'm in a bad, bad, bad place. Yes, and we'll we'll talk about that because the last time I, I had you on, um, the, the Nets hadn't lost to the Knicks in 11 straight games. Kevin Durant was about to put on, had just put on a masterpiece. The Nets were in the stretch of, I believe it was 19 and two before Kevin Durant got hurt. And then the next day, you were about to take your two sons to their first Nets game at Barclays. And then Kyrie put on a masterpiece. And uh, so some things have changed since then, Evan Roberts. So if that you, was that whole thing there to depress me to think about the, uh, the past the distant I, past and how different the world was. It was just to give context to anybody that may have missed the last year between the New York Knicks and the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, I mean, I usually start my my shows, these pregame pods with how are the vibes? I, I think we're getting a hint at how the vibes are in Brooklyn at the moment. Um, so if you want to just take it away, well, how are you feeling these days as a Nets fan? I feel as awful as I have felt in a very long time. I think that the vibes are dead in Brooklyn. I think that there are... And you know this, being a Nick fan, that when things get really, really bad, the diehards are still there. The diehards still watch every game. But a lot of the casuals disappear. They yeah. don't care when the games don't really mean anything. And I think we've clearly seen that, that the few cashes that were intrigued by the Brooklyn Nets, even after the trades of Durant and Kyrie Irving, they have all disappeared. And I even find myself asking a very important question. And I asked myself this question last night. I asked it a few nights earlier. I asked it to my wife, who knows nothing about sports. I said, why do I do this to myself? Why do I even put this basketball team on? All it's going to do is bother me. All it's going to do is cause me pain. And the truth is, I'm not gaining anything out of it. Like, there's nothing that's going to help me learn about the future with this team. So the vibes suck. They're as, as bad as they've ever been. And it's a very, very dark, dark place. That's why a little tiny bit, like a tiny microscopic little bit of uh, happiness would bring me if the Nets could beat the Knicks at Madison Square Garden. That would bring me just a little bit, a little, little bit of happiness that I, I think we as Nets fans deserve in our life. So to the diehards, because you speak on behalf of all 87 of them, as John Macri once noted, uh, the, the fan base total. Um what do you want from the rest of the season? Obviously, one win over the Knicks, maybe two wins over the Knicks because we play each other the last weekend of the season. Are you like watching intently? Like, I want that 10 seed. Is there an apathy to it of like, it doesn't matter if they get the 10 seed? I definitely wanted the 10 seed. I still kind of do want the 10 seed. And I think that because of Atlanta's struggles, I've always remained steadfast on, well, we're not out of it. You know, we're three back in the loss column. We're four back in the loss column. Like, we're right there. But after every loss, the San Antonio one is probably that final kick in the balls, excuse mm. my French, in which you just know this isn't happening. So I've always been a believer, and I, I believe this way even talking about teams I don't love, like about the Knicks, that making the playoffs matters. Making now the play-in tournament matters because you never know. And as a fan, you want to dream. Like, I'm not a believer. I've never been of, ah, the eighth seed, who cares? Like, I remember many years ago at the end of the kind of Darren Williams era, if you want to call it that, they were the eighth seed against Atlanta that year. And the Nets finished under 500. Atlanta won, like, over 60 games, an absurd amount of games. And we took them to six. And it was a 2-2 series. And there was hope. And I always, in the back of my mind, think, you never know. So I want the 10 seed. I do that under the delusion of a fan of, hey, maybe we beat the Bulls. Hey, maybe we – you never know. But the reality is this team sucks. 
That's the reality. The reality is they're not good enough, no matter how much help they get from Atlanta struggling to get the 10 seed. So the answer to your question is, I want it. The problem is they're incapable of taking it. So the losers of seven of their last state, again, just providing context. I'm, I just want people to know they're the bottom five in net rating Thanks. during yeah. this stretch. Bottom five uh, offense, bottom 10 offense and defense during this stretch as well. Um, I will say the Knicks are also a bottom 10 offense, so this may be first to 95 on Saturday, depending on who plays for the Knicks in this game. Look, going into this matchup, aside from the the juice that may exist in a Knicks-Nets rivalry, like, do you sense like the payback that from from your time watching the team? And I know the Mikel Bridges appearance on Jalen Brunson and Josh Hart, Hart's pod uh, went through the airwaves of Nets Twitter of like, oh my gosh, this is yeah. this is pouring salt in the wound. Like, is there that juice even amongst the casual net fans that like if you're going to win one game the rest of the year, I like 10th seed be damned like th- this Saturday has to be the one. Yeah, we want to beat you. Um, we don't like you. I think any real net fan wants to see the Knicks season end in destruction. I mean, that's just who we are. And for Nick fans that don't understand that, I'll give you an analogy that you will understand If you're a Met fan, that's how you feel about the Yankees. Even when the Mets have a bad year, you don't want the Yankees season to end in destruction. So it's it's kind of the same thing. And I think a lot of Knicks fans, or at least a decent amount of them, are Met fans. So I think that would perfectly explain the way we feel. We want your season to end in horrible, horrible destruction. Beating you on a Saturday afternoon at Madison Square Garden doesn't achieve that necessarily. That's why I say it's a small victory. Like, would I feel good by beating the Knicks? Yeah, but it would probably dissipate after like five minutes. You know, I'd rub it in and then realize where am I in life? Like, I'm not going anywhere. The Knicks are going to the postseason. They're not going to fall into the play-in tournament. They're going to be like in a real best of seven series. So, yeah, it's 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 a small victory. I want to win that game. Uh, what, what I did have to make a change on is that my plan all along was to go to this game. I love going to Knicks-Nets games. It's like my mini NBA finals. And I have season tickets at Madison Square Garden, which is a whole nother story. Let's call that a business venture. Uh But on a Saturday afternoon, I was planning on taking the whole family. And the truth is, I can't do that to my sons. I can't have them. I can't risk having them walk into Madison Square Garden with 12 other people rooting for the Nets, if that many, and have them like that vibe too much. So I've decided we're not going. Now, we'll watch. Sure. But I have canceled all plans to go to Madison Square Garden because the last thing I need, especially for my three-year-old, my seven-year-old set, he's a net fan. Nothing's going to change him. But I don't need that three-year-old saying, Dad, Dad, why are they so loud here, Dad, Dad? Why so happy, Dad? Like, I don't want that. So we are not going Madison Square Garden free zone on Saturday. Yeah, I listen. You're more than welcome if you don't want to go to the Garden with a bunch of Knicks fans to come to T Squared Social on Saturday to be around a bunch of Knicks fans there. I'm sure that we could find a nice section of the of the restaurant where where Nets fans can commiserate together. Yeah, as far I'll pass. I'll pass. I, I figured that this would be a different that you'd be turning that down. I I do want to say we're cut from the same cloth from the PTSD. It sounds that like. Like the worst case scenario is why you wouldn't go to the garden with your kids, right? Like the, the I don't need that in my life. It's why, regardless of how good the Knicks have looked, I want no part of playing Miami at any point in the postseason. I yep. want the boogeyman eliminated because the worst case scenario is getting eliminated by them, which is why last season, as fun as that year was, the way it ended was very frustrating. To the Knicks fan that may not be as tuned into the Nets the way you know you are, obviously. Like we, I, we tuned in during playback last night and saw a 90-90 game against the Bucks on the road with Giannis and Dame playing in the fourth quarter. Like the path to the Nets pulling off the upset here. Like is this a team that's still it's still playing hard? Is the, how do you think they might stop Brunson? Like what's the what's been in the times you've seen them pull off some wins lately? What's been the common formula? Well, what you saw last night has been rare. I think a part of our disgust, if you will, with this team, and there have been way too many nights in which the effort is not there, in which they're getting blown out of the building before you can even sit down and get comfortable. And mm. effort has been questioned. That's continued with Kevin Ali as the head coach. So I think what you saw last night, look, the Milwaukee Bucks are an elite team. I don't think on any planet I thought the Nets were winning that game. I was pleased that they fought. I was pleased that they battled. I think the formula is which Mikel Bridges is going to show up. Mikel has been very disappointing this year. And I think one of the beliefs that a lot of Net fans have is that this consecutive game streak, which as impressive as it is, has caused him to wear down. 
The guy plays big minutes. The guy plays every night. The guy has been banged up with injuries, and we have not seen, especially defensively. That's the thing that maybe you can't tell with the stats. He's not the guy we thought he was defensively, at least not this season. And I think a part of that is being worn down. Like, I buy that narrative around Mikel Bridges. So, number one, which Mikel are we going to see? And, look, Cam Thomas has been the guy that I think has gotten Net fans the most excited because we see the offensive game and the bag that he has. The problem is, whether it was Jacques Vaughn or whether it was Kevin Ollie a few nights ago, they don't seem to trust him in crunch time. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, the rotations of Kevin Ali have caused us to raise some questions. And so I think that's kind of the other thing, like which Kevin Ali is going to show up. Is he going to trust Cam late in the game? The formula to winning, though, is they got to come out and give a crap. And I would think that at Madison Square Garden against the Knicks, the give a crap factor will be in our favor. Like they will care. This team also got embarrassed by the Knicks two previous times in their own building. So, Effort has been one of the biggest things we've questioned because I don't know how you guys feel as an outsider to the Nets. Their talent is better than this. They should not be where their record says they are. When they were, for the first few months of the season, a slightly above 500 team, that's who they are. That's who they should be. That's why I was so disgusted. That's why Jacques Vaughn needed to be fired. That's why I've been so bothered by this team. When a team stinks and they stink, which I have experience with, you guys certainly have experience with over the last decade, you say, I get it. I don't get this. They shouldn't be this bad. And so when the effort is there, I think they can compete. If the effort is there on Saturday afternoon, they should compete and have a chance to win the basketball game. So then how does that get fixed as we shift to some more big picture questions about the Nets? Like, do you see Kevin Alley as the coach of the future? No, no. So, okay, that question is immediately answered. But, like, who's the coach? Do you want them to go get a star? Whether it's available, they have a ton of picks. Is it a sell even more? Like, do you see Mikael Bridges potentially being on the block this offseason? Like, what do you want them to do? Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you said, what do I want them to do? Because I know what they're trying to do. They clearly mm-hmm. don't want to sell. I'm a believer of either you sell, Either you cash out and you blow this whole thing up. And I know that sucks to do when you don't have control of your own picks. I mean, kind of familiar with that. I've had that experience before. But either you blow the whole thing up or, yeah, you are aggressive to take your team to the next level. So I think there's no in-between. The problem is the Nets right now are doing an in-between. They're trying to win, kind of. They're planning for the future, kind of. They're in the middle. Um So you mentioned that appearance Mikel Bridges made with Jalen Brunson and Josh. Here's my biggest takeaway from that. It's not about us as fans. It's not it. That's not what bothered me. What bothered me is that guy sounds like someone who's not a leader. He doesn't sound like a leader. He sounds like a guy who's getting bullied by his two friends. And instead of standing up the way Durant used to for us, by the way, Kevin Durant. And I know that probably pissed you guys off. I loved it. He stood up against Nick fans. He stood up against the Knicks. He stood up against, oh yeah, we got a lot of Nick fans in our building. And he would always whether you agree to him or not, it's irrelevant. He would fight for us. He would stand up for our dignity. Mikel Bridges looked like a small weenie, to be quite frank with you. And that's what really annoyed me. He didn't look like someone that was channeling to be a Nick. It wasn't about that. It was just someone who's soft. Someone who's like, oh, yeah, okay, my friends are bullying me. That's not a leader. So I'm concerned based on, A, the play of this team. B, based on that kind of comment, I don't think he's a leader. I think he's a really nice player. I don't think he's the lead guy. Yet teams were offering you packages of a lead guy. So either you cash out, and I wish that package was still out there. I mean, that rocket offer that was reportedly out there, yeah. dude, that's a great offer. Either you do that, or yes, you're bidding big for an available superstar. But what superstar are we even talking about? And are the Nets even capable of getting that guy? I think this is the summer of reckoning. Either you do one or the other. The in-between doesn't work. Mikel Bridges being the lead guy on this team does not work. He's either the secondary or third piece, or he's gone. And that was my takeaway from that interview. He just came across like he's just not he's not an alpha. Yeah. That's what I took from it. Well, to your point about Durant, there was also like the Knicks couldn't beat Durant. That's that's the other takeaway. And yeah. probably why he was able to speak from a place of strength. My takeaway from that interview was I was obviously the one you did about maybe not necessarily like he can't lead my basketball team because he doesn't play for my basketball team, but like 
it very much felt like the Villanova dynamics took over. Like he was yes. very clearly being bullied by his two friends. And this is probably what it was like on team buses or in team hotels. Like this yeah. was their friendship dynamic. And with Durant, he was, I mean, it, the way things ended aside, like he very much when he was on the court performed and embodied what net fans wanted him to be in the sense of the Knicks Nets rivalry. All, all you've got to say, it's not that complicated. Everybody knows the Knicks have more fans. Like I never sat on the radio and said that. I never said we're taking over the city. Anyone who says that they're dumb. Okay. I don't support mm-hmm. that. Not all net fans think that all you've got to say is the way Kevin used to frame it, which is, Hey, we're just building our own little niche. That's it. That's all you got to do. You don't have to bow down to the king. Like, we we, we get it. The Knicks are more popular. Don't yeah. get slapped in the face. Just respond by saying, yeah, we've got our own thing going on over here. And look, this kind of confuses me, but it's the reality. The Nets sell out every night. Like, I'm a season ticket holder to the Nets, and every time I'm there, I look around and I say, who are these people? Like, because that's kind of the joke. Like, I don't know if they're all diehard fans, but the place is always packed with people. So they're clearly watching basketball. Maybe it's the cheaper version than go to Madison Square Garden. So the Nets are building something in terms of popularity, which, quite frankly, I don't give a rat's ass about. I don't care how popular they are. <laughs> right, I right. That's it. That's all I just want to see my team win. I'm just giving you the, hey, they are building something. So just defend it and move on. Instead, he, he kind of bowed down. And it does lead me to believe that on the on the floor, that dynamic would be similar, that he's not a leader. So then... Knowing the Villanova dynamic that exists between those three and obviously DiVincenzo, can you put a debate to bed between it's really just our staff and people that follow us that are convinced there's a Knicks Nets trade on the table? Do you think there's any world where Joe Sy trades Mikhail Bridges to the Knicks, like completes the Villanova package? No, no, there's no shot. There's, there's no either. shot yes. for there's no shot for two reasons. One it's it's the Met Yankee thing again. Like the Nets are just never going to do that. Just like you guys would never do that for us. Like if the Nets still had Durant and Kyrie and we were one piece away mm-hmm. and you had a player that felt like the you just got you guys wouldn't do it. And by the way, I respect that you wouldn't. So a they wouldn't do it. The other thing is, and don't take offense to this because the Knicks have a great offer on the table potentially for another star. They don't have what would make me make the move. You know what I mean? Like, they don't have enough of what would do that. And a part of that is a compliment. Number one, you're too good. So I don't think your picks are that, like, amazing. And then, B, the picks that you have are very fugazi, obviously. They're not like these juicy, sexy, potential lottery pick, first-round picks. And if I'm trading Mikel Bridges, personally, the Houston Rockets are going to be the team I'm doing it with. They can give me something no one else can give, which is control of my own picks back, plus other things. So... There's a basketball transaction dynamic to it, which is you just don't have enough. Even if I took away the Nick Net dynamic, I just wouldn't take your offer, no offense, over the other potential offers. And then, yeah, like from a business perspective, Dolan wouldn't do it for the Nets and Cy certainly wouldn't do it for the Knicks. No question. That's what I also didn't understand about the the rocket trade that they turned down. Like, I understand the like this is the prize you got back for Durant. Like, I understand wanting to remain competitive, but the the do over that that suddenly gets to be able to paint it at like hey we got our picks back like we no longer we have control over our future i don't know if you've seen the movie i know this was a bit on the show but like movies you haven't seen but the movie draft day yeah. um so the end of the sh- end of the movie spoiler alert where kevin costner asks for his pick back picks back uh from the <laughs> seahawks like it's literally the scenario that it sounds like was being painted that you could have like here's Mikel bridges we get a fresh restart. We get all our picks back. We have the Philly picks from the Harden trade. We have all of the we have the Dallas pick and we have the 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 Suns pick. And you're actually in like a a, a great place to start if you're trying to rebuild rather than yes. we owe the next however many picks to Houston, you know? Look, here's what's crazy. I, I invest money in the Nets every year. I pay for season tickets. I will do that no matter how bad they are. Same with the Mets, right? So they've got guys like me by the you know what's. I'm okay with doing the full rebuild because at the end of the day, I want to win a championship. And I'm afraid that Joe Sy and Sean Marks are thinking, we want to win a championship, but we really want to make sure that that building is filled. And like I said, the building is filled. So jokes aside, oh, no one goes to Netscape. No, no, the, the building is filled. And I think in their brain, as inaccurate as, as that may be, they feel like a full rebuild would empty the building. And maybe it would, bro. I have no idea, again, why 
Barkley Center is packed for Nets games, considering how unwatchable they are. But I don't think they have the balls to do the full rebuild because they're afraid of what that building would look like. And like I said to you, man, I don't care what that building looks like. It may be bad for a couple of years, but with all those assets and picks, you put yourself in a position to become good. It may take a while, but you can become good and you can build something, which they've never really done in their time in Brooklyn. It's been a long time since we sat through kind of building up a roster. Um, Look at the quick fixes they tried when they first got to Brooklyn. And did it work? I mean, if you're okay with making the playoffs three years in a row and only winning one round, I guess. So I think they're afraid of that. But your question of why wouldn't they do it? The answer is because I don't think they believe a full rebuild is something they can sustain. Which is interesting because just from a Knicks perspective, one of the more fun years that people bring up is while the, the frustration with Julius and the thumbs down of it all, like, the growth from quickly and the, the growth from RJ, that second year of Tibbs, you know, people point to that. And while you can't sell winning, you can sell hope. You know, there's a lot, been a lot of books written about the, the Sixers and what they went through. And the problem is that you could never sell hope because Hinky was like, oh, we have a good young player. We're going to trade him. But the marketing team was like, I had, we had all this material for Michael Carter Williams that was going to be on our, our, how are we going to sell? season tickets and nobody you know knows who the the future is so i i would wonder if the nets just took the selling of hope the way the thunder had the last couple of years and we'll see we'll see if that's a direction they take the tough part from my perspective in i'm again just adding context is that you're maybe a shoe size away from actually accomplishing said championship that you wanted the team to win like if you look back and i'm sorry to make you do this But like, what's the turning point that you look at as like where it all went the other direction? It could be, you know, during that year where Kyrie was playing half the time. It could even just be last year when they didn't offer him the extension. But if you had to point to a turning point or where it all went wrong, what would it be? COVID. So COVID, so a pandemic is what is where it all went wrong. <laughs> yes, because of the, the vaccine mandate. Yeah. I think the vaccine mandate killed them because, you know, it's funny. And I don't know if this is just me talking myself into something different. I no longer look at the Kevin Durant, you know, center meter being the difference between that and a championship because I think they were going to run out of gas. I don't think Kyrie Irving was coming back that soon off that ankle sprain. James Harden was a shell of his former self when he pushed his way back for game five. As great as Durant was, I don't know if he was going to be able to single-handedly get through that conference finals against Atlanta. I don't know if he was going to single-handedly get through that NBA finals. I think some Net fans, and I understand why you say it, it's easy to say, ah, they would have won a title. I don't know that. I I, Because I don't know if Kyrie walks through that door at any moment. And that ankle sprain was bad, bro. So I, I kind of lean towards no, he doesn't come back. And James Harden was on a half a leg. So think about what they needed to do to win game five and what they were getting to win potentially game seven. They were getting superhuman efforts from Kevin Durant playing 47 minutes. Like, was he going to do that for another two rounds? Not one round, two rounds. So I look at 06 with the Mets more clearly as, boy, mm. if Beltron swings the bat, hits it up the alley, we win a World Series. Because it's easy to kind of look at one more series with a better team and say, we win the World Series than it is even for the Nets because it's two more rounds and they were banged up. So that's, now again, maybe that's me talking myself into the alternate reality of, hey, it wouldn't have guaranteed me a title. As far as what did everything in, Kyrie Irving being a part-time player, the Nets initially not allowing him to be a part-time player, James Harden getting fed up with it and pushing his way out. Because I think if that never happens, I don't think James Harden ever forces his way out. I don't think Kyrie Irving ever forces his way out because my understanding is max deals were on the table for everybody and the pandemic, or I should say the vaccine mandate changed that. So that's the one man. Look, there were greater implications from COVID and the vaccine mandate than my dopey basketball team. But if you are looking for the one thing that really derailed what could have been great, it was clearly the vaccine mandate and all of the fallout that came out of it because it wasn't just Harden demanding a trade. I think it was Kyrie distrusting the Nets mm. and the Nets distrusting Kyrie because I think there were conversations during that whole period that he was going to get the vaccine. Now he's not getting the vaccine. How come they're not standing up for me? And I think it caused everything to destruct, which ultimately led to Kevin Durant saying, I don't want to be here anymore. So clearly it's that. Right, right. Well, 
look, I it was fascinating to watch from my perspective because, look, I, as you well know, my fat face was making its way around Nets Twitter every single time that the Knicks would get killed by the Nets. And now the, the power dynamics have somewhat shifted, which leads to the Mount Rushmore of rivals. I ask every single guest here that there are four teams that they hate the most. I already know one of the, the teams on your Mount Rushmore. I don't think we can. We just put the Knicks there and, and call it a day. But like, is there a close second or is there the three distant second, third and fourth? Like who are, who else is on your Mount Rushmore? I wouldn't say it's a close second, but the other two teams that jump out at me and they're not a shocking surprise would be the Boston Celtics. Uh, obviously, you know, just Boston in general. But I think mm-hmm. back to that series where they swept us. Game one really changed everything. I mean, that was such a freaking winnable game. And I think back to that, and, and not even that, when we beat them, and the Nets beat them twice in a row in the postseason, all the way back in 02, the conference finals, and then obviously annihilating them in 03, it, just the battles with them. Like that Eastern Conference finals in 2002, man, was a war, especially the way the Nets completely collapsed and blew game three in Boston. Which say, is, game three, yeah, legendary game, yeah. Oh, my God. That was one of the worst experiences as a sports fan in my entire life. Like, it's up there now. I got to rewrite the story because they won the series. So, ultimately, you can look back happy at it. But the war with Boston, I certainly put Philadelphia up there, going back to the hard-fought 2019 series where Joel Embiid began proving how dirty and how scummy of a basketball player he is. Um, the fourth one, you know, I it's tough because I, I think back to hard losses, like losing to the Pistons in a seventh game in which they were non-competitive in the war of that series. But do I hate the Pistons now? Not really. Losing the NBA Finals to the San Antonio Spurs. Do I hate the San Antonio Spurs? Not really. So I'll actually side with you guys and say the Miami Heat. Uh, We've had our wars with Miami. The problem, though, is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. (laughs) And so lately, especially last year, I have been able to put that rivalry aside for the greater good. So that was your Yankee Philly World Series last year was why <laughs> having no idea. Like I, I'm rooting for Black Sunday, but if I have to root for a team to win, I'll root for the so we're, actually question. Well, who are you rooting for in the 09 World Series? I was rooting for the Philadelphia Phillies, unfortunately. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the rationale was, you know, especially being on the air, Yankees win the World Series. It's in our backyard. There's a parade. There's Yankee fan friends. We all have brothers and sisters. If the Phillies win, you're able to flush it a little bit. You're not in the city. You're not being forced to celebrate with them in a way. So it was tough, though. I'm not going to say that was easy because I can't stand either team. So the tough part for me, I went Yankees that series because I just didn't need back to back Phillies titles, especially going into like the Mets just went into a new building and we had our issues with like City Field basically having no fence. And it was one of those softball fields like Central Park where you just Hopefully you hit it far enough and you can you can win the game, um, hit a home run. And I just I don't need back to back championships coming from inside the division. I get it. Well. I, it. There was no good answer, by the way. Like, yeah. It, it was, yeah. Like think about this. I I I assume a lot of Nick fans, well, at least most Nick fans, don't like the Nets and you don't like the Celtics. Well, when we're playing the Celtics a couple of years ago, you're just picking the lesser of two evils. You know, you obviously don't want to see the Nets go on a run, but do you really want to see the Celtics go on a run? So it's. It's like if you guys play Boston or Philadelphia, I'm going to have to do the same thing. I'm going to pick the lesser of two evils, which is clearly them, because I'm certainly not rooting for you. <laughs> I expect nothing less, Evan. I know we're short on time, but I have to bring up that you're about to be a published author because uh, <laughs> it's available now for pre-order. Mine is supposed to come in the next week or so. And to the Knicks fans listening that hate when I talk about baseball, you're just going to have to live with it. My Mets Bible scoring 30 years of baseball fandom from WFAN's Evan Roberts. Um, what went into writing the book? Like, what, what what inspired you? Who approached you? What's the thought behind the I, book? I admit, Craig Cart, my former partner, brought it up because I oh. score every Met game, and I've been doing it my entire life to this day. Um, and we were talking about you should publish it. You should put it to good use. And so then the idea started being, okay, how do I put it to good use? Am I just going to make a coffee table book of all my scorecards? Uh, so I started writing about the eighty one most memorable games that I scored, which essentially is every important game in Met history over the last 30 plus years. There are very few games I missed that I didn't score. So any game that was big in the last 30 years, I can promise you is in this book. And so I started writing about kind of what was going on in my life, 
how I felt during that game. So it's a real heavy, you know, Mets book and also a little bit about, you know, me as a 12 year old scoring a game versus me as a 36 year old scoring a game. So it ended up kind of telling the story of my life, but mostly my story and our story. If you're a Met fan as a fan, because these wins and these losses, these are ones we never forget. And there are yeah. a lot of losses in this book. This is not Mets classics where they're 81 and 0. Let me promise you that. There's a lot of wins, but there's a lot of brutal losses. And so each scorecard is there. You see the full scorecard. And then I write about the Mets and myself throughout. So I get a lot of praise sometime on here about my photographic memory that I can just go back to a game and be like, oh, this is the context of when it happened. Two people in that I've followed over the years are the reasons why or the people I strive to be like. You're one of them. It's like you and Bill Simmons are the historians I that I try to be like. <laughs> And it, like part of that is because I have a scorebook in my parents' house in Long Island of the 2000 World Series. I sat there with a <laughs> scorebook. I sat there scoring a lot of Knicks games in the late 90s. So I like the, it's the same principle to an extent of like because you're actually keeping track of it, it sticks with you better. So I look, I can't wait to dive into the book. But I think any baseball fan, maybe even like a Yankee fan that hates the Mets and just wants to relive some of their worst <laughs> memories over the last you know, it's, couple it's decades, funny. you know, I. I appreciate that, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, Yankee fans, you're going to want to get this book Mm -hmm. because I calculated the Yankees record in my Mets Bible. There are 13 Yankee games versus the Mets, obviously, in this book. and The Yankees won nine of them. So they have a dominant record in this book. So and by the way, Mets fans, would you expect like how many freaking memorable wins do we have against those bastards? There aren't that many to pick. So for the Yankee fan, you can kind of. Read the book and laugh at our tears. It is certainly an option for you. So there's only four that the Mets have won in the book? That you is correct. <laughs> so it's game... Did you go game three of the World I Series? Game three. I, every Subway World Series game is in this book. All five okay. games. So yes, we got the, the World Matt Franco win. game. The Matt Franco game is two. Dave Malicki? Dave Malicki is three. And it's then... Two. Geez, the last one... Tricky. It's tricky. I can't... Uh, by the way, by the way... There's is two. it... I, it was it a Sunday night baseball game. Was it Mo Vaughn's three run homer against David Wells, or was it um, the Piazza homer in the eighth inning? It was like an obscure season, but that's the other game I'm thinking of. Neither made the book. There were actually, I, my mistake, 14 games. It's nine and five. So there's five Met wins. So there's two more. The two, um, did you pick two from when they won all four in 2014? So neither. Okay. The Matt Harvey game where they beat Rivera. Oh, do, oh, six, the David Wright walk off. Okay. I'm officially done guessing. Where are you going with this? I, I admit that it's because it meant something to me at the time. And I'll explain it to you why. First of all, the night they fired, the Mets fired all their coaches. It was a Sunday night game. Yeah. They had already lost the first two games. They had fired all their coaches. It felt like basically Bobby Valentine's job was on the line. And not only did the Mets win that game, but Roger Clemens had a consecutive win streak that got snapped. And Derek Jeter had a consecutive on base streak that got snapped. So I get it. That may not be the most memorable Met Yankee game to some. To me, it was monstrous. It was Sunday night baseball, 1999. And then the other one, And this one's weird, but I had to include it because it was so effing weird. 2020, during the pandemic. Rosario. Okay. Ahmed Rosario, game winner at Yankee Stadium, slash Steve Cohen buys the Mets. It all happened within a few hours of each other. So Mets beat the Yankees, pandemic season, winning a game at Yankee Stadium and a walk-off. Figure that one out. By the way, a walk off in the seventh inning. In the, it's right, it's just, so if I remember right, that was game two of a double header. Yes. That was both the 14 innings were played. It's a walk off in Yankee Stadium by a Met that's not there. And we had just gotten the news that Steve Cohen was buying the team. Bingo. So. And in that moment, I thought it was the greatest day in Met history because mm-hmm. I said big win against the Yankees. We're on our way. We're in a pennant race. That didn't work out. Steve Cohen's buying the Mets, which I think for the most part has worked out. So, yeah, that's the other one. That's why those last two are tricky, I admit. The 99 one you went to, the other part of that that is a fun footnote, that was Piazza hitting a home run off of Clemens for the first time, which then led to three straight starts against the Mets where Clemens was, in his appearances, gave up a home run to Piazza. 100%. And then the fourth... 
the fourth one, he decided he was going to take action. And the rest is kind of history for those who, who know the story. The question I was going to ask you, and I mean, you already said you have all five games scored in the book is can you name every, how they scored every run in the 2000 World Series? But I'm pretty sure every run. <laughs> yeah. So that's 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 where I go to. They only scored 11 runs. So <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know which what run the runs that are most memorable from that the, World Series? The ones they didn't score? The Timo Perez not well, running around third base? Yeah. Besides that was when, and this one sticks with me so much, game two, the Clemens bat-throwing series. In the ninth inning, they started rallying against Mariano Rivera, and Jay Payton hit an opposite field home run. And I remember looking at my dad saying, too little, too late. Six five. This son yep. of a bitch. It's a home <laughs> run against Mariano Rivera in the World Series. And the next batter was Kurt Abbott. Down by a run with two outs. So it's like, great, he hit a home run. We're still down to our final effing out with this shit player up. Mm -hmm. And I think Kurt Abbott struck out on three pitches. So I, I'd have to I, I probably struggle to name every single run, but I'll tell you this that Jay Payton home run sticks with me more than any other run they scored in that World Series. So let me I, I promise it's it's 60 seconds and I'll I'll get you out of here. So game one, they scored three runs. It's a Bubba Trammell two run single, Edgardo Alfonso infield single. Those are the three runs. Right. Piazza two run homer, Jay Payton three run homer. Those are the five runs he gave <laughs> game two. Uh Ventura solo homer, uh Alfonso double that scores Piazza. Agbayani's double up the gap that scores yep. Zeal. Joe McEwing sack fly. That's game three. Game four is uh, Piazza two run homer. That's it. And then game five is two infields, two, two balls that don't yes. leave the infield. Al Leiter bunt infield single to score a run. Yes. Uh, yes. And then I believe it's Agbayani infield single that goes under a barehanded yep. Scott Brocious. That's all the Met, the runs the Mets scored in that series, which That's is why it. I go back to like it's not another domination. The Mets just didn't hit for five games. Did know? not hit. Oh my god, so far. That's the World Series that we will never though 2015 it bothers me almost on the same level. Because they that led was for 87% another, of the series. Yeah. <laughs> just such a missed opportunity. And what killed yeah. me about that series is game one replicated game one of the Subway series. Everything about it felt like this eerie freaking time warp. And then the whole series mirrored each other. Lose the first two, win game three, yep. lose the series in five. Like just freaking brutal, bro. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, this this man turned into an episode of Mets Therapy, but I appreciate <laughs> you coming on uh, and talking about the Nets as well. Again, if you want to check out Evan's book, My Mets Bible, av available wherever books are available to be bought and pre-ordered. You can get it now. We'll have a link in our description, both on YouTube and on Twitter. Uh, and Evan, as always, thank you so much for joining me for edition of the Knicks Film School pregame show. Before you get out of here, before the Knicks thank play you. the Nets, any uh, anything you'd like to plug? <laughs> you did well, then your book fan. that I just plugged. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can listen to me at Tiki 2 o'clock on WFN. And if you are a Mets fan, Rico Bro on your podcast. We try to get it two, three times a week talking Mets, getting into the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, but thank you very much. I do appreciate it, man. Of, of course. It's always great having you. Obviously, a legend in this this market and a legend in the in the sports fan uh, world as well. Uh, and to everybody listening, thank you for joining me for another edition of the Knicks Film School pregame show. We do this before every game. I'll be back on Monday to preview the game against the Brooklyn, against the Detroit Pistons, uh, as well as I will be at T-Squared Social on Saturday. So if you want to join us for Knicks Nets, we can watch the game together, hopefully break this KFS curse. But until next time, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the game tonight and I'll speak with you soon. Peace.